Starting with our second panel of the day, Trouble Space. Um, and to introduce the panelists, I'm going to invite a uh, second year graduate student in the Department of Geography, Maria Pettis. Thank you so much uh, for attending. Um, welcome to the second half of our panel. Uh, so, the three panelists we're going to have today Elizabeth Ruth Hunter. Um, Rip Kajafi and Devin Mia, in that order. I'd like to first invite um, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth is a doctoral student in African American Studies and African Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley. Centering Afro-Nordic perspectives, her primary questions revolve around dominating discourses of national belonging in Scandinavia. At the moment, she looks at the relationship between, sorry, Awkward fold. The relationship between Nordic egalitarianism and institutionalized racism as it manifests spatially. She asks how the insistence on racelessness and colonial amnesia informs a narrative of the proper citizen subject and construct its other. Elizabeth was born and raised in Denmark and earned her MA in cross-cultural studies from the University of Copenhagen and a BA in cultural encounters. Um, at, is it Ron Rodskin University? <laughs> no, that's right. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it actually introduced pretty well what it is that I'm doing. Um, my overall question is of belonging springs from my own uh, my own life, being asked, where are you from in the country that I was born in, um, which um, disturbs this idea that everyone belongs, even if equality is such a big um, value to them. Um, and so an aspect of why that, that question is so disturbing is because we don't have race in Denmark, we don't have race in Western Europe generally, so it's a discourse, and that also means that uh, the category doesn't appear in the census, which I think is very important to know. Um, so it's both culturally and discursively, that's not a thing that, that uh, appears in the vocabulary to, to discuss um, equality and inequality, and also legally it's not a category that is, uh, that is operated with. So these are the conditions um, for a life as a brown person in Denmark. So just to contextualize, contextualize the country a little more, it's a small welfare state. Um, it has 5.5 million people in it. The area corresponds to 10% of California. Um, you might know it as a very well-functioning welfare state. It's often uh, used as an example to follow, free education, free health care, good parental leave uh, agreements, and so on. Um, and so I am looking at um, the relationship between uh, space and time that produce entangled notions of race, geography, and nation. Um, that's sort of a new angle. I've worked more on like race, sexuality, and gender. And so space is new to me, time is new to me, so I hope um, that you'll give me sweet and generous feedback mm -hmm. um, while I think out loud with you all. Um, yeah, so, so, so Denmark is known also as the happiest country in the world, right? And this is one of the images that I really want to disturb. Um, and to go back to its size, um, if you count Greenland and the Faroe Islands, Denmark is consider considerably larger. And so obviously there are political reasons to do so or to not do that. Um, what I'm focusing on is not that part of colonialism, but it's really important to know that Greenland and the Faroe Islands are currently 
uh, part of the Danish kingdom, and there are human beings living in both places, and especially in Greenland, so the condition of uh, the people there, both in Greenland and the ones who um, have been forced to move to Denmark in these sort of like civilization schooling projects, um, their condition is very much, is very similar to that of Native Americans here. So I just want to acknowledge that, but that's also going on, and that's like uh, a part of uh, the Danish territory officially. So what I'll focus on is um, the relationship to the Danish West Indies, which are now the U.S. Virgin Islands. And I've been doing that uh, thinking about how European nationhood has been shaped by the wealth of the transatlantic economy, while plantation slavery has been out of sight for this general Danish population. And also what might be the connections between colonial amnesia colorblind racism and the spatial separation of European plantations from their metropole. So that's how I'm framing Denmark and that's how I'm framing um, Western European countries as ex-metropoles and that we live in the aftermath of, of that um, center of power, whereas a lot of um, theory on blackness that I've read is, is centered and localized in the US or the Caribbean, so there, there are those um, differences in what function those spaces have served, right, in the, in the colonial enterprise. So the way I look at space now um, in the current context of Denmark, um, there's been a lot of new legislation through the last 10 to 15 years talking about zones, um, visitation zones, where police could stop and frisk people without a warrant. And uh, I've been interested in what that has done to the, to the neighborhoods, but also who exactly are stuck and who continue to live as they all live. So this, um, this is part of a general uh, discourse to talk about spaces in a particular way in the city of Copenhagen. Um, and it was very clearly articulated in a new law, which is called the Ghetto Law or the Ghetto Plan, that was published in 2018 under the former um, government. It is uh, continued by the present government. It changed last year. They don't promote the plan, but they do carry it out. And so um, the, the report that you see here is called One Denmark Without Parallel Societies. And the goal, which is the subtitle, is No Ghettos in 2030. And so I am, um, I'm interested in what is a ghetto because uh, social housing has been a part of the welfare model. Um, it's been sort of a pride to give as many people as possible access to, to proper living for uh, a cheap rent and so on. So social housing has not in itself been stigmatized. And now there's this new uh, discourse and there is something called the ghetto list and particular areas come uh, are put onto that list when they fill certain criteria. So um, that's what I've been interested in. So um, to think through these things, uh, these relationships of space and race and nationality, I've been um, thinking through three uh, themes, coloniality, modernity, and spatiality. And so today I want to really talk about the spatiality part, which is, as I said, the new one, and, um, but it really is something that is emerging in the discourse to talk about us and them and belonging and, and unbelonging. So just briefly um, on coloniality and modernity. Coloniality has been, uh, reading decolonial scholarship has been a way for me to get a framework to talk about race in a way that um, identifies, identifies relations of power and that racial categorization follow relationships of power and that it's not something inherent to bodies or that we have uh, categories, racial categories that are uh, already there for us to grasp or for us to um, discover and that we can apply globally, right? So um, through this kind of literature, I've been really contextualizing racialization and, and I think that's how it, it works uh, best for me, it works well generally, I think, to really contextualize the concepts that we use. Modernity has been a way for me to think about um, the paradoxes that occur 
especially studying race and racism in uh, a European context with all these narratives of progressiveness, being um, sort of the, the heroes of the world, showing um, a good example of, for Denmark, you know, welfare society or green energy or what it is. And then at the same time, actually having uh, a lot of racial tensions going on, having the whole uh, situation with refugees, uh, asylum camps, deportation camps, and so on, which again are super spatialized. And all of this is discussed mostly within like a discourse of integration, but never racism, because again, that is, that is unthinkable. Um, we were over that, or rather, we actually never have that, right? So there's this notion of white innocence that uh, Gloria Becker uses that's been very helpful for me to think through how uh, Denmark can at the same time be this ex-colonial nation with all this wealth from plantation uh, enterprises and also be completely innocent today and definitely not racist because here we have uh, equality, right? So um, what, I, what I see happening uh, through spatiality is um, is in this discourse about the ghettos, right? And so the definition of a ghetto, according to, to the, um, the report that the government wrote, is that it's a public housing area with at least 1,000 residents where the share of immigrants from non-Western countries exceeds 50% and where at least two of the following criteria are met. And then the next criteria are um, something, a connection to job market, a criminal status, educational status, or educational level, and a minimum income, right? But we understand from this, this definition that um, a, an area is only made into a ghetto if there's this particular number of this particular group who lives there. So I'm interested in, okay, what kind of people make a place into a ghetto, right? What, what, what is it about them? Um, what is it about this economy? And it seems to be very central, again, both on a, on a discursive level, the idea of the West and the non-West, and also on, on a very practical level, because this, uh, unlike race, is a category that is used in the census. So it's used to track immigrants, and also descendants are tracked in the same way, Western or non-Western. And those are the only categories that we have. So, so it's an important category, the, the non-Western. And I see, I see non-Western working in two ways. Um, well, in many different ways, but particularly in two ways because it imagines um, the the Western or the Dane sometimes that is that is used as an opposition, non-Western and Danish. Um, it is used to talk about space. It's used to talk about here and there, and it's also used to say something about time. So um, the spatial aspect of it is something that is, um, it appears through this question that, that we all receive, all of us from white, where are you from? And it does, it does a lot. It, it, it implies that you can not possibly be from exactly the grounds that you stand, um, and it and it invites you to locate the place elsewhere that you are from, right? So there's this notion of uh, difference as distance that Johannes Davian has um, has uh, coined, and I think it's it's interesting because it it says something about the the other, both far away, the countries that they're supposed to be from, and it also says something about or the, the spatial distance sort of follows the, the other into Copenhagen and into the other big cities in the ghettos because the ghetto is also defined and delimited as the zone where something undanish is going on and that is what uh, creates a parallel society, right? Um, and the other aspect of the Western and non Western is that of modernity. And in the report, they do use the, the language of our modern society. And, um, and part of the problem with parallel societies is that, well, they are 
not modern enough. So there's a whole mission to um, to update uh, these residents. So some of the methods to uh, eradicate ghettos by 2030 is either completely tear them down, that's the solution for, for certain areas, others are sold to uh, private corporations, some American ones actually, and others are um, uh, in, in other areas, certain residents are forced, uh, dispersed into the general society, and uh, at the same time, the general population are also invited, kind of invited to move in, and that happens through, um, like they can skip the waiting list if they have education or the job or so on, so that you can get what is called like a resourceful population moving in, and so deluding the unwesternness within these defined areas, right? Um, so what is, what is going on in this discourse is um, sort of a disciplining or a uh, civilization of the non-Western, and it happens through some proposed uh, measures, which are mandatory daycare, for example, from the kids are one year old. It's about quotas, uh, the non-Western to, to Western uh, percentage in primary school, in um, high school, and so on. Again, to delude or to um, mix up mix up the unwesternness with uh, Western, right? And so just a little note, because here, when it also concerns the children, it, it reinforces this notion and the category of descendants of, right? Because you can't, in, according to the system, you can actually not become Danish when your parents are classified as your Western. So you're born and raised in Denmark, and still you're assumed to not really master the language, not really know um, the codes, the culture, and what is called um, the values of equality and intolerance that is uh, apparently particularly Danish. So uh, it happens through both, it's targeted through the, um, at the children, and also in very gendered patterns where these families are assumed to be heterosexual nuclear families, and at the same time, they're not quite straight, because what they can't do is they can't reproduce the nation, because the, uh, they, won't, they won't reproduce little citizens. Um, so there is a kind of pathologization of both imagined parents, um, where the, the mother needs help from from Denmark, from the state, um, to actually take up her responsibility to educate um, to educate uh, citizens, which is which is not going on right now. And at the same time, women and children are also victimized um, because there's a lot of measures being done with regard to domestic violence, uh, force. Um, repression of women and so on. So it implies also here that the, the father is um, uncivilized and not conducting family life as between Denmark where the self-understanding is that women have as much freedom and also economic freedom as men do. And so there needs to be an upgrade and a modernization going on, right? So there's sort of an evolutionist um, discourse um, and at this a distance made in um, Denmark, Denmark, which is in the, the or the Dane, who is in the present, and the non-Western who's in the past, and needs 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 to to catch up to us. So I use this uh, notion of arrested development um, by Neville Hogue, which is actually a title of a, of an article called "Arrested Development or the Queerness of the Savage." which is this way that they, the, the, the non-Western family can't, can't be fully straight because they do not produce the new citizens that we need to, uh, to reproduce the nation. And um, so part of this logic, which is from um, Johannes Flavia, is a persistent and systematic tendency to place the reference of anthropology in a time other than the present of the producer of anthropological discourse. Um, 
And I think this is um, this is sort of a double. They're completely tied together, the distance in time and space between the other, both as imagined in the question, where are you from? Which, by the way, we all get, um, whether we're immigrants or not. Um, and then also the, the uh, evolutionary time that we're imagined to, to belong to. So I think the, the, non, the Western and Western discourse is super important to, um, to think with um, when theorizing racialization in these contexts. And so just a brief little uh, perspectivization, which is, so we have no racism in Denmark, but we have extremely racist law, right? That, that just uses a different language than race. They talk about Western and Westernness, and who can belong and not um, through across time and space. And so there's also this other project that I think is interesting, which is a private project by some Danish um, architects which goes on in the U.S. Virgin Islands today. And I just want to bring this up as a paradox or as a tension between the innocence at home and then an active um, investment quite concretely in terms of finances, a reproduction of, um, of colonial structures, because this project is about restoring Danish architecture in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's about our common past. Uh, maintaining the traces of Denmark and um, a colonial nostalgia um, to, to maintain and to not forget that in fact these islands were Danish at once, they aren't anymore, and it is possible to do this project and to uh, have warm feelings about the islands without any complicity, without any connection between that wealth um, and the Danish welfare society, and also it's a very big uh, budget that they have 20, 20, um, 20 million dollars and there's just one word that comes into mind which is which is not being imp implemented and that is reparations for example um, instead this money is going to two buildings that need restoration so we can maintain and uh, celebrate our common past in the US Virgin Islands um, just food for thought and so I'll end Give me just a um, second. Our next speaker will be Rivka Jaffe. So Dr. Jaffe is a professor of urban geography at the Department of Human Geography and Planning and International Development Studies at the Center of, and the Center for Urban Studies within the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research. Prior to joining the uh, UVA, she held teaching and research positions at Leiden University and the University of the West Indies and the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asia and Caribbean Studies. Connecting geography, anthropology, and cultural studies, her research focuses primarily on intersections of the urban and political, and specifically on the spatialization and materialization of power, difference and inequality within cities. She's interested in how urban problems, such as poverty, crime, and environmental degradation, are linked to social differentiation along lines of ethnicity, class, and gender. Rifki is awesome. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. understand the role of animals in the formation of urban difference, urban inequality. 
what I want to do is to develop a more than human approach, a more than human geography approach to urban inequality that connects directly to inequalities between users. Um, so, so more than human term in, in geography is sometimes quite apolitical, but thinking about movements of different things. Um, so what I want to do is focus on uh, difference primarily through the lens of social spatial boundary formation, inequality, think about how urban risks and resources are distributed unequally across spaces and populations, um, but also to extend thinking about animals and humans to also include infrastructure in the broad sense of social technical systems. So let me sketch the contours of this conceptual project in the making before I zoom in on the case of security, animal security dogs in Kingston. Uh, so in recent years, urban studies of geography uh, has demonstrated a growing interest in what you call non-human entities, trying to understand their role in shaping inequality. So you see this right clearly in its infrastructural term. Uh, in urban studies, uh, where you see studies of uh, transport, energy, water infrastructures, highlighting how these social technical systems co produce urban inequalities by integrating residents into urban economies, urban policies, and shaping their capacity to access um, essential goods and services. So, so this from both study infrastructural and anthropology. Closely related, but not quite the same, you see a rapidly expanding interest in urban things. Um, looking at how the social is co-constituted by different materialities and technologies. So looking at artifacts, architecture, concrete, different types of materials. Um, and you see the connection to actual network theory or the literature and so on. Also a move to destabilize subjects to object categories. Uh, while exploring the idea of material agency, how different objects are concentrated on uh, things. So this, this uh, if you talk about the nature of the infrastructure term, this material term, the material term, it's also the case of the table of apolitical thinking, that slowly the social, but not necessarily uh, engaging the structures of power. Uh, at the same time, with this sort of turn towards the non human, you see here, it's, it's largely ignores the urban nature. But uh, at the same time, you have a, a largely a distinct uh, body of work, so we also put the earthly traditions of geography. So we have political ecology, urban political ecology, and urban nature, and thinking about how also flows of uh, water, energy, food, and waste, and physical flows um, reproduce and reflect inequalities. Um, and then this work really highlights the race, class, gendered uh, character of, of urban political ecology, as well as the roots in um, histories of colonialism. So even though here you see a direct engagement with urban nature, urban political ecology, somewhat surprisingly, has hardly um, concentrated on animals, but focused very much on human agency, not so much on the agency of these flows. Um, but, but to me, actually, the strangest thing is that it looks at, let's say, inanimate nature and not at simply uh, animals. So and then you see a third field, which, again, as I sort of you know, this myself, I'm quite surprised that they tend to not interact very much the growing body in geography uh, and anthropology of, of work on human animal relations. Uh, and here you see developments of uh, an understanding of animals as, as knowing, feeling, caring subjects who actively create meaningful relationships with each other, with humans, and with the landscapes they inhabit. Um, pointing to their, their cognitive, their emotional, their communicative capacities, <coughs> this research seeks to trouble human animal divide and to emphasize animal agency. Uh, and here, though, uh, maybe also married to uh, city nature divide, as you see in a lot of literature, the focus has been primarily on wilderness or remote context or on agriculture, uh, school, and uh, human relationships. And in addition to, to this non urban focus, this research has tended to overlook how the more than human context zones, you could say, in which different species meet and mingle, uh, these context zones also infra uh, involve infrastructure. Technology, other forms of non living matter. So, I want to bring these things together and to ask uh, what if we study animals, humans, and things together to understand how their interactions and their relations result in unequal distribution of risks and So, how might we uh, extend our analyses of the politics of non human matter to include sentience, animated being, and also to understand the politics of them? So, trying to apply these larger sort of conceptual questions to uh, case of dogs, 
university to develop the thinking from the case of dogs. Uh, my overarching questions really are how do we understand the discourses and practices involving dogs, which it seems to actually are always security dogs. So there's really hardly a dog that is not seen as a security animal in some way. Uh, so how do these discourses and practices produce or reproduce existing formations of inequality? Uh, equality? And what is the maybe slightly more active role of dogs in shaping these unhuman geographies of protection on the one hand, but also the danger of it? So, how can we see this role of dogs in delineating boundaries between different categories of humans uh, with, with race or with skin color um, and after form of concept? But also, how do we maybe see a re negotiation of certain types of inequalities uh, in the way that security professionals, specifically security guards, uh, as well as other urban measures to negotiate urban uh, insecurity through their relationships. And here, uh, in, in the latter question, uh, that's where I also see technology coming into the relationships between different types of security, infrastructure, security technology, and jobs, and different urban messages. So, um, uh, I've been looking at different types of jobs, different types of security professionals, but also households who use jobs. Uh, as kind of security uh, objects or security companions. Uh, so working with private security companies, with the military, and a broad range of data professionals, uh, as well as households as well. So some of you know very well, studies we do that. Keeps uh, the city suffering from very high rates of crime and violence, uh, also high rates of fear. Um, and it's also this somewhat simplified uh, representation, but the, the city is really, or the city and its urban differences is made and remade through a binary spatial imaginary that maps glass and skin color onto urban space in a way that, that uh, divides it roughly into an uptown and a downtown. So the downtown uh, neighborhood is understood as ghettos, um, and uptown often described as having residential areas. And this is a, a class divide that also maps onto uh, history of racial and exclusion. So downtown is associated with lower income, so called black Jamaicans, versus the middle class or elite, white skinned, uh, makes the sense, uh, brown downtown residents. Uh, so this is sort of a brown rather than white versus a black distinction in terms of race or color. Uh, most poverty, most violent crime also is concentrated in downtown cases, and there's many racist and classist really uh, discourses on crime, in sort of explaining why, why is crime going to this. This split along lines of class and color is also cut through by a, a violent political divide, <coughs> often referred to as political vitalism. The downtown cases and different neighborhoods are associated either with the People's National Party, the PLD, or the Jamaica Labor Party. The JLP. Um, but I'll grab the more white is also going to be So dogs don't un they don't stand outside of these entrenched divides. So as we say, one private security uh, kennel I saw well, there's showing the dog describing the different breeds they had. And to one side of the kennel I saw the sun uh, sign saying downtown jobs only. So it was really segregated into different types of dogs. Uh, so I asked the kennel manager about this distinction, um, they laughed for a little bit. No, a couple of ladies, uh, the sign is a little bit of a joke, but at the same time he said, there's different uh, breeds they have, and certain scary looking breeds are better fit for downtown. And the dogs going there put an explicit request for this type of dog, the downtown dog, whereas a more beautiful breed um, is better for uptown. So I said, we have different shifts for dogs. We have dogs that go downtown, and we have dogs that go uptown. And the difference between downtown and uptown dogs is we have location that needs a particular set of dogs. So there's some handlers that request certain types of dogs. An uptown breed would be more like a, a Rocky, a Rottweiler, or a German Shepherd, uh, whereas a downtown would be more like a pit bull. Downtown, you only have a rough types. So when a pit bull walks, just the thought of looking at a pit bull makes you want to turn away, so you don't want to bother going there. So the same company prided itself on its Akita dogs. This is a breed uh, that was considered both beautiful and aggressive, but was also largely unsuitable to the Jamaican climate, as it was prone to overheating and it frequently got sick from overload. So Akita, as the kennel manager explained, were an uptown You You will not send them down. They're too beautiful. You would put them up there where they can more comfortable. How come these downtown? 
Nobody will see that that's the right one. So beyond the thinking, there was also a biological dimension before we got a key test fit to the big in geography. So the sensitivity of this, this particular reef, the heat, meant they were also uh, biologically a better fit for the cooler, greener, hillier spaces of up down as opposed to the hotter, lower lying, and dense field areas of downtown. The other panel managers and uh, dog handlers I spoke to confirmed that there were certain trees that were more effective downtown. So they also mentioned the bad and red dog and black dog in particular, including kibbles and the little kids. This spatial appropriateness of different dogs in different parts of Kingston reflects the record. Conflations of place, class, race, and danger. So the existence of a downtown dog as a concept of an living animal reaffirms the understanding that those people, always implicitly race and class people who inhabit that part of Kingston, are both undeserving of canine beliefs and so rough that they only display here in the case of most frightening dogs. Beyond these connections to this these built environment, dogs are often socialized as human prejudices are trained consciously or unconsciously to recognize those in specific perceptions of words. So up-down dogs, as other dogs do, they, they assume the class is the shade is, as well as sex is disposition. Not because they have a canine ideology of class or racial hierarchy, but because they're socialized as human in different shades of words. So in white cravings, so uh, dogs are trained to delight uh, to be able to attack this experience of people. The threats that dogs are presented with Literally actors or, or security guards will act as the threat. Uh, they tend to look, speak, and move like the stereotypical downtown residents. So it's really a performance, a type of script, uh, if you get to see uh, trainings, with a dark, dark skinned trainer performing the role of a papa speaking, so not English, but an real swaggering and wrestling, so really screaming, um, shouting, in a sort of papa phrase. Uh, so this is one type of what's called visual imprinting. Uh, Teaches dogs to associate a certain visual scene with a certain type of behavior, reinforcing the prejudicial image of the threat. But these processes are also at work in less of, uh, business, official, training uh, context, also in domestic environments with untrained dog dogs. So I spoke to Lorraine, a wealthier dog professional who lives in a, a hilly area of uh, the city and would generally be considered proud. She stressed this in sort of imprinting without prompting. She said, I've always told people. I've had one or two dogs on my legs. Wonderful home pets. Other are color prejudiced. And they were like, why is that? That's because you make them like that. And I'm like, no. How many people do you set, see trying to climb my walls and see off my back? So she was arguing because her dogs only in this darker skin, so black, not brown intruders, she suggested it was only natural that they would come to be prejudiced against this group of Jamaicans. This was just how visual imprinting worked. So your point again, she said, they see a certain type of person. It could be a certain type of smell, looks, maybe it's dreadlocks, etc. It doesn't matter. If it were blue, blonde eyes, sorry, blonde, blue eyes, it wouldn't matter. To just say this is how dog imprinting works, and she said it's also as a profession. But the same time, of course, it's rarely blue eyed blonde Jamaicans who are profiled by dogs. Um, and I, I don't think that the race account is necessarily inaccurate. I, I don't think she actively sought to instill all kinds of things for dogs at all. But her positioning within Kingston's patterns of class and color segregation that the dogs in her household were apparently less likely to encounter uh, dark skinned black uh, Kingstonians as house guests than as police. So you can't see the visual imprinting as separate from uh, the city segregation itself. So to move on from class and color to other types of boundaries, political boundaries, um, this type of threat identification that I've just discussed is largely disadvantageous for low income black Jamaicans, but other dogs can be socialized differently, precisely to protect those from people that they consider to be dangerous. So dogs may also reproduce the boundaries between politically opposed low-income neighborhoods. So as driving along with um, the purple of dogs, uh, the like one security company to the different sites across the city where they were all uh, with spend the night working. So we drove through one street, which was between two antagonistic and <coughs> affiliated um, neighborhoods uh, as, as dogs began to fall. Uh, and there, Handler Sean was explaining to me how or how the neighborhood dogs from different sides of the border, they were running along the street with us uh, as part went by barking at the dogs inside. Uh, but he pointed out how they actually would never cross the street. So they would run along the sidewalk, along the back, and then cross the side of the balcony. 
to explain that they thought it was something patterned their odor as night fall they will trust in person with their respective political um, and territories that, that have uh, grown over time. And this type of political boundary making could also take the shape of a broader, you could say, anti state disposition. So in some inner city neighborhoods, guns <coughs> learn to recognize the needs of soldiers as threatening outsiders and to mark and boarding when they see them entering the area. So the director of the National Animal uh, Welfare Agency, Veronica, described to me how abandoned and wounded animals brought her kennel after what was noticed to be incursion, a major security operation, uh, during which soldiers and police killed uh, some 70 Jamaican citizens. So she talked about these dogs. She said, I'll never forget one in particular, a pit bull. I called him Tiffany. If he smelled that the police were a soldier, he could smell him from the doorway. He would go ballistic. The whole kennel would go. He would go ballistic. And then there was another brown dog she described. It was a little brown mongrel, evil, absolutely that dog was trained to only kick out when police are around. Oh, it's a fact. It's a given, a given tactic. So she explained how these dogs were socialized into this anti state disposition. She said, I quote, they consider the police and military as a form of aggression against them. But they were watching how, from their puppies, their owners react when they see police and soldiers. So they're just mimicking what they see from the people that care for them. So I think this, uh, this is a, a newspaper image taken just after the Tiffany incursion. Uh, the caption read, an enraged dog marks at Jamaican defense for soldiers on patrol in Korean gardens following the security operation. So it actually doesn't look that enraged to me, but, but there is a sense also that the dogs take on this, this rage. Um, I think these examples show a political boundary making how dogs act also as a type of semi agentive communicative security device or also a security person. Uh, they reproduce lines of conflict, political antagonism. As well as class the race hierarchies. They channel existing prejudices, and also direct security towards certain spaces and certain persons rather than others. Now, by marking differentiation between threatening and vulnerable populations in Kingston, guard dogs reproduce social spatial difference and inequality. Um, and you see this also within the context of labor. Um, so the labor of working dogs employed by public and private security agencies treated as more valuable than that of their human counterparts, uh, with regards to people at the police officers. Uh, but at the same time, dogs also mitigate some of uh, the precarity that guards experience. So they diminish some of the risks and stresses that they face as neighborhoods. I've been trying to understand how guards also understand dogs in relation to, to physical threats, how they relate also to inanimate forms, particularly to dogs and specifically weapons. So let me give one brief example. Here's a, a guard elaborating on how a dog's sentient skills help, help him navigate the security landscape compared to weapons. So, so the reason I prefer the canine over the gun, uh, a sketchy gun, is typically in Jamaica, people love them. The dog's better than the gun because you might be sleeping, but the dog's there, and barks, and you'll jump up and hold him, but uh, you know, the, the dog will say, no man, something is wrong. But at the same time, the gun is there, and you can sleep. And this people colleague added, by the time you're awake, sometimes so compared to other security tools, such as firearms, a dog is not inert. It doesn't sleep when it's human it does. The dogs are hypersentient, or at least partially autonomous for big movements, uh, and guards often fall asleep during night work or doing other shifts or doing some triple shifts. And a gun in this context could be a liability rather than an asset. So, um, uh, so the bad men will seek the steal of sleeping guard's gun, where that's a gun, again, is remaining asleep on uh, his or her feet. Uh, at the same time, their doctors stay alert during the night, double rousing guard if any threat emerges. Um, however, as, as various canine professionals emphasize to me, the dog does have a level of agency there. So if uh, a, a dog will only alert the guard for the owner, that is an absolute situation. If they have an emotional connection of loyalty and love with that human. So if you mistreat uh, your dog, the dog will just let you sleep even as an intruder enters the dog's territory. Now, dogs, uh, sorry, guards do, in fact, often develop emotional connections to the dogs they work with. And uh, the kennel managers often try to pair guards with their favorite dog because they also think this will work better uh, to protect both the guard and their property. Uh, and these dogs also keep uh, the guards company during long, lonely nighttime shifts. And this bond is an important part, I think, of interspecies labor, interspecies care. 
Uh, however, at the same time, in interviews, guards also suggested that they, while they have this type of loving relationship, they also apply a more instrumental uh, approach to dogs as, as more tools than colleagues. So in describing the benefit of a dog over a gun, the same guard uh, here uh, also emphasized slightly coolly that if faced with an armed criminal, uh, you could let your dog loose at the gunman and he'd be forced to shoot the dog while you were able to run away. So a dog also worked as a shield, so not just as a, a sort of alarm system and a deterrent, but also as a shield so you yourself could, could get away while the, the dog is getting shot. Um, so just to wrap up very quickly, I hope to have shown uh, in, in a, the most sort of quick uh, generic uh, sense how the case of Kingston security dogs illustrates the possibility of a more than human approach to difference and inequality in cities. Um, looking at, at dogs, uh, forms of, of territoriality and mobility, um, both sometimes agentive but often enforced by their humans in reproducing urban divisions. So even as dogs can distinguish between what they've learned to see as good and bad humans, beautiful dogs and bad dogs connect to urban socio-spatial differentiation co-producing socio-spatial boundaries and supporting the unequal distribution of protection across urban spaces and population. So I think there's been a lot of research uh, in recent years on security technology and uh, critiquing the idea that these work in, in neutral fashions um, and showing how they, they actually reproduce dominant race, class, and gender differentiations of humans across urban landscapes. I hope to have shown in, in uh, again, sort of a preliminary way that dogs have a similar function. Yet even as they enable the continued circulation of such entrenched ideas, dogs can also reconfigure, in perhaps smaller ways, geographies of protection and endangerment. So even the baddest dogs, whose behavior may regularly instill fear in passersby, often develop positive, effective relations with their caretakers, from owners, wealthy owners, to low-paid security guards and military handlers. So through their specific embodied doggish qualities, um, their olfactory and auditory capacities to identify threats, but also their effective charismatic capacities to bond with humans, dogs provide not just protection, but emotional support as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffe. I conveniently own a black pit bull. So for our final panelist for uh, Troubled Space, I'd like to invite um, Devin Pina. Devin is an architect and an entrepreneur. She is the 375th black woman to become a registered architect in the country. Snaps to that, that's great. Um, she's the founder of Archidev, a conceptual design firm that creates pitch-ready projects for community groups and startups. Um, Devin researches the historical and cultural landscape of Cape Verde, West African Islands, her ancestral home, contributing to a database to aid in the design of socially responsible, responsible and sustainable development. Welcome. Is it on? Okay. <laughs>
Oh, yeah. Maybe have like another screen up in the door. Oh yeah, that's this top five, so. I think if you exit out of this top five. Hello everyone, my name is Devin Pina, as she introduced. Um, I am an architect. Uh, there's This presentation will be a little different just because my research background is not that of academic. <laughs> I graduated in 2012 from North Carolina State University and since then have been in the profession, getting different experience in um, affordable housing, community design, um, commercial, everything you could think of just to really understand the field as best I could and become the best architect I can be because my ultimate goal is to build in Cape Verde. Um, I felt like I was at the point in my career where I wouldn't be able to just take it anymore unless I knew what it was like in Cape Verde because even though I'm Cape Verdean, my family's been in the States since the early 1900s, so I'm third generation American. My great grandparents came over here. Um, so we lost the language, um, we lost a lot of the cultural aspects, but in a way maintained the Cape Verdean community that we had in the States in, in, as a micro community. I kind of uh, equated to like how Italian American is its own thing, Cape Verdean American is kind of its own thing. But to be able to build in Cape Verde, I took it from that aspect. I didn't want to be a designer that didn't know the, the root culture and come in and do anything that was not responsible. So after visiting Cape Verde, I realized that um, there were not many monuments or any type of architecture informed that informed the landscape there. It's all dedicated to the Portuguese for the most part. There are a few structures um, that are representative of the culture, but we got our independence in 1975, and there's been a lot of cultural change, um, but it's not necessarily located in the built environment. So I'm making this as layman's as possible, partly because of experience, but partly because I also want it to be translatable, and hopefully I can translate it to Creole to um, my Cape Verdean friends. So my essential points are what is architecture, what is Cape Verde, and what is Cape Verdean architecture. So architecture is pretty complex, as is Cape Verde. So I, I'm, I was excited to see what types of parallels I could draw together. Architecture is a build expression and cultural and environmental response to this, the environment. Um, and a lot of times that's done in ways that does not reflect the community, especially communities of black and brown um, descent, especially from the diaspora. So even though Cape Verde is an African country and it is in the continent of Africa, it's a group of islands that's off the west coast and it was originally uninhabited. So they moved droves of West Africans to Cape Verde, colonized it. It was, one, it was the first country in the whole continent to be colonized. And this happened years before the transatlantic slave trade. So the culture has moved in, in very different ways. And to identify as Cape Verdean can mean a million different things. Um, so Cape Verde is, is a place that has about 500,000 Cape Verdeans living there. But there's actually the same amount of Cape Verdeans living in the US. So this culture has been transient for a very long time and has built itself in a lot of different places. So I call it the second diaspora of Cape Verde because not only in the US, there's a big population in, in 
and Portugal, that's who colonized Cape Verde, um, and other countries, as I'll show later. So upon visiting, that was my first time. My family never had been back since we immigrated over, except my mom came back um, when she, because she was a teacher, so over the summer she went um, with, a, with a mission group, but she found it hard to connect culturally because she didn't know the language. And in Cape Verde, there's an education disparity. So even if you know Portugal, Portuguese, you still might not be locked into the real culture. So when I went in 2018, I made it my mission to learn Creole. So um, what I found was that there, and what I already knew, interestingly enough, was that there are two concepts that really create the culture of Cape Verde. We have Sodad, which means a longing for. So since so much of the culture has been transient, a lot of Cape Verdeans long for Cape Verde. And it's, it's a cultural thing. It's in the music. Um, and then a, when you return Volta, you have Morabeza. So Morabeza is a welcoming love that all Cape Verdeans have, whether it's your house, somebody's welcoming you and your house into in New England or in Prai. So this is Cesare Everett. She's a world-class singer. Um, and it's funny that this island is so tiny and it doesn't have many people, but the music industry is what drives this culture. And it's so rooted into who we are. So I'm not going to sing this, but the, <laughs> um, the song says, Que mostre bo, bo wait, hold on. Que mostre I'm a new speaker. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah, now I got to sing it because I can't speak it. Oh, my God. Okay, so, que mostre bem? Wait, que mostre bo caminho longe? Que mostre bo caminho longe? Es caminho passado to me. And then it says, Sodad, 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 es minha terra, Sunny Cloud. Bo escrevim, ta escrevi. Bo esquecem, ta esquecer. Até dia que vou botar. So that means. Who will show me the way? Who will show me the way? The way to San Tomé. So San Tomé in principle is also another island that was also colonized by Cape Verde. And a lot of, there's a lot of Cape Verdeans that live there as well. Um, and they moved there because of issues with drought and famine that forced people to move um, away. It's not this tropical island that they have a very arid climate and there's a lot of drought constantly. And that um, Portugal is the main, uh, entity that provides aid. So when there was um, that period of time where they were getting their independence, there was a lot of people who suffered. Um, so it says he says, if you write me, I'll write back. If you forget me, I'll forget you too until the day I return. So that's kind of the cultural anchor of what Cape Verde really means. Even if you never, my grandmother never even got to go to Cape Verde, and she's the most Cape Verdean woman I ever knew. <laughs> So this is Morabeza welcoming love. This, um, I experienced this form of connection uh, in Cape Verde. I don't have any family that lived there now that I know of, at least from my mother's side, because I grew up with a single mother. So I had a decision to either focus my efforts on learning the culture, the subculture of my mother's island, which is Brava, or kind of connect with the family that is living from my father's side. Um, which is Fogel, which is another island. But I chose to do as much research as I could about my mother's island because I just had a deeper connection um, in a limited time. So I actually ended up reaching out to a blog over there called Nosse Criola, and that means um, we are Cape Verdean women. So it, it highlights different women um, from the diaspora of Cape Verde all over. And um, I just I slid in their DMs on Instagram. <laughs> And I ended up uh, staying with her family in Cape She lived in London, and that was my first stop. And I stayed with her, and then she connected me to her family. And um, I learned Creole through their family because they didn't speak English, and I had to learn. Um, so as far as what a living monument is, because there isn't, there isn't many physical monuments and, and urban dedication to Cape Verdean culture, the Cape Verdeans themselves are the living monuments, the architecture of Cape Verde as it exists today. And that's comprised of our language and then the diasporic emigration. So our language is Creole. So it says Creole, Creolu, that's a little confusing. So 
for those who don't know, a Creole is a classification of languages. It has a European language that is the base, and then it's influenced by West African languages. So for example, Patois would be the base is English, and then it's mixed with West African. If you have a French base mixed with the West African, you have Haitian Creole. So for Cape Verdean Creole, that would be Portuguese with African influences. And I didn't mention, but it actually was illegal to speak Creole um, for a long time, and you couldn't speak it in school. So it actually created a disparity from people actually seeking education or having, having the provision of education. And that's kind of what was the catalyst that happened um, to lead to liberation with Amaka Cabral, um, which um, he formed a group that encompassed Angola, Guinea-Bissau, and many um, Lusophone, Portuguese-speaking countries to kind of uprise against the, the European power that existed at the time. So these are the um, demographics of where Cape Verdeans live. If you add it up, I'm not going to do that, but it's over a million. And you have 500,000 uh, in Cape Verde and, and in the U.S., 150 in Portugal, Angola, 45,000. Saint-Tomé and Príncipe would be 25,000. Senegal, 25,000. Um, Netherlands, oh, I'm sorry, uh, France, 25,000. Netherlands, 20,000. Spain, 12.5, uh, and then Luxembourg, 7,000. So it's, it's crazy how many Cape Verdeans live in diaspora countries, African country, and European countries. Well, I guess technically some European countries could be considered diaspora countries as the US is as well. So it's just an interesting place that it's actually a continent, it's part of the African continent, but it's also a diaspora country, which is very unique. Um, so the existing monuments that exist that I've, um, that I experienced myself, I flew into the Cesaria Evora, the woman I just sang and butchered that song, um, her airport, and then you have a Nelson Mandela airport. They're the UNESCO um, organization dedicated a World Heritage Site to Ciudad Ivela, which is a historic city in Cape Verde. And then last, you have the Tarafal uh, concentration camp, which held Cape Verdeans, Angolans, Guinea-Bissau, uh, people that were members of this group that Emoko or Cabral uh, formed. Um, and this is, this, there's nine inhabited islands, and this is what I've um, experience in all of those islands. So if you can imagine, there, there's, not, there's not a lot. So the new development that's happening now, you have ongoing and existing European development. There's resorts. That's the big part of uh, Cape Verde's economy is the um, hospitality industry. Basically, Cape Verde is like the European version of the, the Caribbean. So how Americans usually go to Caribbean for vacation, that's what Europeans are kind of trending and starting to do now, and the resorts are really booming. And so much so that the Macau legend Cape Verde Casino Resort is a new building that's coming up, and it's a, it's a huge development, it's or sorry, $200 million project. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of African development all over, I mean, sorry, Chinese development all over Africa, and this is, an extension of that. I actually was in, in Praia when this was happening, and we're walking down the street. I'm with my, um, my friend's children and my friends, and um, we couldn't, there was, this is an island, so there's water all around, but there was literally just like this much area that you could actually go and enjoy the beach. And that just, as much as it will be helping the economy, I wonder what the, implica the implications of um, the environmental and social aspect uh, will happen there in the next few years. They have a 75-year deal, uh, 75 year deal with them and then also a 25-year gambling deal. So I'm just, I think it will provide a lot of jobs and a lot of um, economic support that Cape Verde needs, but they're also, it needs to happen in a sustainable, uh, socially and, and environmentally sustainable way. So hopefully that the research that I am doing and I'm creating this database to inform the uh, public about Cape Verdean cultures that I got access to when I learned the language of Creole. Um, and I want to create this database that will serve as um, help for culture mapping and place, ma place making into the community. 
um, so that, you know, developers like that, they might not even blink their eye at it, but people who are from this Cape Verdean diaspora, all these millions of people who have goals to come back to Cape Verde to, to really um, influence and help build will have just this database so that they can do that in an informed way and not have to um, figure out a whole language if that's something. I mean, I think you should always learn Creole if you're from Cape Verde, but it's not easy. <laughs> so culture mapping is safeguarding cultural diversity by mapping distinct people's tangible and intangible cultural assets within local landscape. This is a term that was developed by UNESCO and they have a whole um, system as far as how to do that. So that would be an integral part into this research. And then placemaking is a multifaceted approach to the planning, design, and management of public space Placemaking capitalizes on a local community's assets, inspiration, and potential with the intention of creating public space that promotes people's health, happiness, and well-being. Um, I think Cape Verdeans, and as like any other nomadic type of community, create their home um, and in, in a very centralized to the family kind of way. They, I've been to people's houses where, you know, and I came and, and I learned how to say, because uh, people look at you if you're in Cape Verde and you don't speak Creole, they just go, like, hey, <laughs> how do you not? And I learned how to say my family came over in 1902. I think I just picked the year, but it was the early 1900s. <laughs> so, mil nove, senti dos. Um, I, my family came over. I said my parents were here. I was born in America, but I'm Cape Verdean. And Cape Verdeans told me, like, don't say you're American. Like, say you were born in America, but you are Cape Verdean. That was important. Um, so that's what I would say, and um, I said I want to build here one day. I'm an architect. Oh, you're an architect. Come look at my house, and it, it would be this kind of programmatic, like almost a modular housing that they build upon. So more, when more family come, when more money come, they just build and build upon that house, and it has like a centralized um, living, like communal lim living um, facility. And you can see that actually through a lot of different uh, examples throughout the world. But it's interesting to see that how a culture with very limited resources uh, is able to do that. So that's the research that I'm doing. It's very active research, not academic so much, but I'm doing it in order to build there one day and um, just taking it step by step. Thank you. might be most unexpected about dogs becoming, you know, being taught to be racist. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, like, it's a kind of a cliche, a lot of, you know, South Africa, you expect racist dogs, like, when you're in some urban areas, and all that, you expect dogs to be racist. It's like a bit of a thing. Yeah, um, so, I'm taking it as I go, whatever I feel, and whatever, the more Cape Verdean Creole I learn, the more I learn about the culture, whatever the needs of the society is. I have my own ideas, but I also wanted them to be informed by what the actual needs are. Um, I have, I came up with a, a project called the Livelihood Neighborhood, which provides sustainable um, housing and job opportunities, and um, as well as mentorship. 
And that actually applies. So I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. That's where J. Cole the Rapper is from. And if you've seen any of his, his <laughs> specials on HBO, it's not like the nicest place. So I, I want this model to be translatable to the needs of each place. So I realize in Cape Verde, there's a lot of single mothers. Uh, uh, historically, it's gender that men get to leave and, and seek more education and that kind of thing. Now we have women that are doing that more. But um, there's a lot of single mothers that live in Cape Verde. So that housing would be geared towards them versus in Fayetteville would be geared towards um, people, youth of, um, with inconsistent living situations. Because in Cape Verde, everybody, for the most part, takes care of their families. So that's actually not a really large problem, <coughs> but human trafficking, of course, like anywhere else um, to, the, to the other side, and, and even here, um, is a really big issue. So anything that I could tie to, like, would, that would have a return um, on investment for leaders, um, if they're tackling things like homelessness, um, human trafficking, things that are big issues so that there would be guaranteed by health care, anything that would have guaranteed funding, but also progress to the people. Oh, so uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I wasn't necessarily surprised myself that they're racist, but uh, what surprised me is this is more about the Netherlands, which is very similar to Denmark. Uh, my university newspaper or online um, did a very small sort of little article on my research with as a header, can dogs be, as a question, can dogs be racist or sexist? And they have an open comment policy. And the amount of hateful racist comments uh, was so distressing, I stopped looking. So apparently the idea that a dog can be racist at least to a Dutch audience, is incredibly like ridiculous, and the fact that taxpayer money is funding this type of research is an outrage. Uh, but that, that's not really your question. Uh, but but I think to some, from some context, it's very natural, uh, or or to be expected, and others uh, less so. Which has to do with also how we think about animal agency, or that race, or how we think about racism, whether racism is something uh, of individual intent which I think is a Dutch construction of the construction of racism, like evil people who want to do something, as opposed to a structure that we're all socialized into, also if we're not human. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what I actually found unexpected was, uh, based also on my own reading of, of more historical texts and uh, of, I'd say, uh, readings about dogs in African-American history and, and sort of contemporary relations, and also Haiti, which is that, so what I found interesting about dogs is also their, their complicity in um, slavery, uh, and also literally policing the boundaries of the plantation and the boundaries of who, who is considered human. Uh, so I very much expected that to be a part of contemporary uh, perspectives on dogs. But no, I mean, of course, you might see it in, in non-verbal ways, but when I ask people about this, I said this was my interest, how do you think sort of histories, because uh, also dogs were used in similar ways in Jamaica. How do you think, does it still play a role? People are like, meh. Uh, but also, people did not speak about dogs in the same way that, that I've seen described for both uh, port au Prince and uh, sort of African-American context here. Uh, they spoke very highly on the whole of dogs as having a type of moral purity in contrast with humans. So where humans are, corrupt and to be distrusted, and a human would like, put you the wrong way in terms of a threat. If a dog tells you this guy, or a woman, but you should, is a threat, you should trust them because they're never, ever wrong. Um, which I, I don't think is possible, but it's really a sense that on the one hand, yes, they're socialized into racism, classism, sexism. On the other hand, they have a moral purity, which you, which you would never find in a human, and it cannot be wrong. So I, found, I find that surprising and interesting. Okay. Just a quick follow-up question to that. I was fascinated by your talk, but also um, I wanted you to speak in the context of green specific legislation and also like the different cultural markers of what makes like a dog a black dog. Um, like, mer like there's intersections of certain breeds with African American culture and hip hop culture. I think that might um, then leave perceptions that have spread globally. And I was wondering if the Netherlands have, has any like breed specific legislation, I think it's really popular in some European countries to say, oh, no black dogs allowed, like no American peoples, um, as opposed to like if there's this type of legislation at all in Jamaica. So, oh, so I've, I've, I've been looking a little bit at laws I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think there's like a pitbull law, but um, 
until very recently, dogs could only be imported via uh, the UK uh, in the context of rabies law. So I'm interested in that type of legal configuration. I don't know if that's breed specific per se. And, and we look at laws that say who, who is responsible if a dog bites you. So if I, back in the 19th century, if your dog bites and hurts someone, you're actually liable as that order. But that's not um, what you're asking, really. But I think, as I've kind of described, the black dogs are, are just the color black. So also mm -hmm. Rottweilers, uh, or if you would find uh, you know, other bees that were very dark, it would also be considered a black dog. But, but there is something about the idea that a bad dog is a black dog, it's a scary dog. Uh, which, which can't be read, I think, entirely outside of the racial formation. Um, but in terms of legislation, also some of the breeders, the, the Netherlands is actually um, now a big exporter of uh, security dogs, uh, not directly to Jamaica, but uh, I was also f visiting um, dog breeding sites in the Netherlands and dog trainers and breeders in Jamaica are also aware that you know, this is a circuit. And they were also saying, like, as pit bulls are outlawed, people are breeding dogs that are officially not pit bulls, but are as close to a pit bull as you can possibly get. Um, so there's this whole dance also of breeding, which I think would be, maybe not my project, but another project about genetics and the idea of how, how dog race, dog breeds, dog difference is, is sometimes read through DNA or, or sort of physio physiognomic features, and sometimes totally a social construct. But. I don't know that that's my project, but there's definitely something going on there. Well, yeah, I mean, can I just do something? This is just a, a, a old memory. So I'm from Jamaica, me myself. But perhaps you're right in that, that as, as you just said that now, I have a 1980s memory of people using the Jamaicans to the part of black dog to describe, to describe somebody they would think of as a disruptive black person. So, um, go a black dog as a, as a, a racialized idea of class, uh, um, lower class black people in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. But my question is, Elizabeth, I must first of all say to you that I almost feel like we live in the same country. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you miss saying is not where are you from, but is the part where they say, where are you really from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> say, yeah. say that too. Say that. question number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. It's too, yeah. I need to emphasize. But I wonder, I want to provoke you. Might I provoke? <laughs> For many reasons I want to provoke. Um, on the one hand, I want to ask you, um, so you go to, if I, if I understand it, questions of coloniality, modernity, which, which, which ties very much into the language of Mineola and the decolonial school in some ways, and um, which is a, in many ways, wonderful way of thinking and very much in Europe today. But I wonder if there's something else at stake because you're also in, in Denmark, which is connected to Greenland, which has a history of, of probably a racializing project that is projected onto Greenland, for which, so I, I was reading this book recently, Life Beyond Itself, or Beside Itself, which is about um, the Inuit, and how racializing language of assimilation was an attempt at making the Inuit as less Inuit as possible to become, and it was done in a, a biometric, a bio, a bio politics of care. To care for them, we will make them less Inuit. So I wonder if the language of the policies that you are seeing are not necessarily so coloniality wherever, but actually could be seen as, a, as where Greenland is a testing ground for these racializing ideas on the Greenland people. Mm -hmm. How does Greenland fit? into the narratives that, that develop as the, the identity narratives, first of all. My first question. And my second question is, and this is the troubling part of it, and I even feel, in this audience, forgive me, for even saying it, but what is the relationship between Islam in the context of the Nordic space there? So how does religion and culturalization play out in this narrative? And as an extension of that, might we use race as well as something else as a critical lens to try and understand what is at stake? So you, you go to race, but what else might be at stake? I would be interested in asking. And I have 16 more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great questions. 
Um, the first one, I think it's um, on, on Greenland, it's super good. I just haven't gotten to it at all. And um, yeah, so that's, that's that. I think there's definitely something about it and uh, the reason why it's, it's, um, it's so much in the background of what I do, I think is also the, the role of Inuits in Denmark, the particular way they're racialized in Denmark is complete invisibilization as if they're, they don't exist anymore, right? And um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the role that they get. And then the construction of the Arab, which ties into your next question, is like the thug. That's, that's the big, um, the, the, like the ultimate other, right? And so, yeah, so to your first question, I'm just, I mean, we can talk about it in some years when I know more. And because it is so important, because it's right now. It's, it's people from the generation of the 60s who were removed from their families into these um, what you, boarding schools or something to be, become less Inuit, right? So uh, you can hear those, those stories and testimonies of people who live today because it's, it's very present. So I appreciate that question and I want to look into that more. And so Islam, and I didn't really get to name that, but that's obviously, that's completely central. That is the, the, the non-Western, that is the Muslim, right? And it's just incredible how it is never mentioned directly. So Denmark is a secular country, supposedly, but it's secular Christian, right? And, and apparently also, Christianity and Islam are complete opposites. They're completely incompatible. That's how it's it's constructed. So um, the role of Islam is, uh, or not Islam, right? Islamophobia. Um, there has been, just like in other European countries like France, there's been, um, um, we cover it up, call it a cover up uh, prohibition. So it sounds like it, it targets everyone else, for example, anarchists who also sometimes cover up, but it's very much, um, in, in, in common language, is called uh, the Burka uh, prohibition, and it's targeting uh, the niqab particularly. Um, and some months ago, um, the first person, woman, got arrested um, because you can't carry it anymore, right, in, in public spaces. So Islam is completely central, and that's also why I want to, um, yeah, maybe there's a better term than, than race, but I think racialization can do something that is not uh, tied to bodies, right? Because the way, um, the terminology that I get from decolonial thought is racialization as an act of differentiation, of creating hierarchy, and of creating um, a distinction between the, the human and the non-human. And um, with, within this discourse, um, um, m being marked as Muslim, which happens to many brown people, right? But being marked as such then you are the ultimate other. And that's across where you actually are from, if you actually are religious or not. Um, and that's that has something to do with a particular form of brownness, which I call like the middle brown belt, which is everything from Morocco to Pakistan, everything in between, sort of olive, you're all Arab, right, or Denmark. So, uh, yeah, very simple. Thank you. Yeah, so, it occurs to me that in each of your projects, there is a, a question about creolization that I want to get you to think about. Right? So, so definitely in your project, right, you talk about creole as a language, right? But there is a process of racial formation that is creolization, right? Whether it's the the West African right, forced appropriation of Portuguese cultural norms and language, etc. And I want you to get, I want you to think a little bit more about, right? So how do we get to to creole because it's such a a sincere attachment to Creole identity, mm -hmm. right? In the fact that you're able to, to trace it, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is the thing that forms a diasporic circuit that, that you're actually following, right? Following back home, in a way. 
uh, Elizabeth, there seems to be this resistance to creolization, right, in your context, right? And I think we can understand why in, say, a Western European country, um, there wouldn't necessarily be the space to produce a Creole subject as we saw, right, in the Americas. But at the same time, through a process of incorporation, there does seem, I guess, like in some ways you are a Creole subject, right, of, of, of mixed background and, right, being infused or the various cultures being fused into, into Danish culture, right? So I want, I'm wondering what the refusal is there. I'm Rufko, and I'm sorry, I've stepped out, so maybe you said something about this. But I'm thinking about the most Creole species in Jamaica, the <laughs> feared and beloved Mongol dog, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, in a way, what's interesting in what you're bringing up is that there's this, like, really, um, the question of, of breeding, right, and, 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 and pure breeding, right? Um, seems to be kind of out of place, kind of in, in, a, in a way. I mean, Jamaica, right, given the, the kind of racial history, right, may not, may perhaps not as much in, in other Caribbean contexts, right, but this question of, 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 of purity, right, that seems to be coming out as we attach the kind of species to their facility of securitization or fear or what have you. Um, but what about the, the mongrel dog? Because, I mean, that is, you know, the greatest <laughs> generator of fear. Uh, <laughs> For me, I mean, I've been chased by a mongrel dog many times. So, um, so is the mongrel? Is the mongrel? Yeah, you know what I mean, you know. But is the mongrel dog like in this more than human notion of the Caribbean, like the quintessential Caribbean subject? So, I mean, I don't know. Anyone? Can you say? Okay. Um, that's interesting because um, there's been rising crime in Praia, which is the capital of Cape Verde. Um, but for a long time in, in my island, Brav is like the countryside, so there's not a lot of crime. And but there's a lot of dogs, a lot of stray dogs. Um, not necessarily used for security, but definitely not pets. You don't you know mess with those things that are like. <laughs> seen as just mangy and you know, like we don't do dogs like that. Like but my sister like that's it. like she FaceTimes me is like, say hi to T T Dad. I was like, that's not my nephew. Um, <laughs> so it's just interesting how, you know, cultural like American culture can impact um, your perception of things. Um, it's in, so in Cape Verde, Creole is distinctly the language, even though there so there's the language of of Creole and then there's the people that are Creole and I guess because it's a diaspora country it makes it a Creole uh, a cultural identity in that sense but Cape Verdeans don't identify as Creole people um, there are people that are of darker complexion middle complexion lighter there aren't white Cape Verdeans like in say Latin America you have white Latinos um, but so one observation that I did notice when I went there that it was a lot more darker skinned Cape Verdeans on the islands, that 500,000 versus the 500,000 that's in the US. And that gave me pause because I always thought I was like post child Cape Verdean, like right down the middle, you know, my complexion, everything like that. Um, and there's not a lot of third generation that are both, um, both parents are Cape Verdean too. And then I grew up in the American South, so everybody thought I was Puerto Rican. Um, and it was hard to explain that I'm black. You're black, both parents, like, yeah. They're like, how, where are you from, Africa? How are you light skin? Like, it's, it's an ongoing. So like, there's just a difference between, you know, your racial identity is not your racial composition. It's solely, it's racial composition and, and your racial perception. It was funny, because I was listening to you describe dogs in that way, talking about the black dogs. It's something that is in their genetics versus something that's like a soul, like how they are perceived. But I think that as far as how black people or black Americans, that's how you identify. It's like, um, for example, if you, you know, black all your life, your parents, you know, you could trace it back to the plantations, but you do a 23andMe or Ancestry.com and you're only 38% African um, from like the, the sub-Saharan African region. Do you now denounce that and you accept your Europeanness? Not necessarily, you know. So in Cape Verdean, it's, it's just interesting to see um, going there and seeing like oh wow you know what like i've read that the cape verdean oh sorry the portuguese fishermen because that's our main industry and that's why cape verdeans mostly live in new england and like the high schools called the whalers and that kind of thing because they were um very very skilled whalers and 
and fishermen, and they the light the lighter the skin, the more trust that was generated. So that's how you got to get like buy your ticket to go to the United States. Um, so even though you might come dirt poor, the opportunity is where the wealth is, and I think that has to do with the nature of the more Creoleness as the part of the race versus. But all Cape Verdeans, there's not a separation, and I'm not saying that as a light-skinned person. Like literally, like there isn't a separation culturally. There's, it's like in American where, I'm sorry, in America where you have a Southern family and one, you know, the two parents are dark skin, one is dark and one's light, and the child comes out a different complexion. It's the same in Cape Verde because it's been uh, culturally there for, you know, years and years longer than any other uh, uh, island that had been uh, manufactured culturally, um, and there isn't the um, the Inuit or the Aboriginal aspect that is kind of baseline for a lot of Latino cultures. Um, so it's, and it, that's just, I've learned so much going back and learning that and being like, wow, like, you know, there's dark skin Cape Verdeans and one side is like, wow, I have a pride in that because all these years I've been saying I'm black and look at us for real, we're black. But then there's a shame too, because it's like, well, why did my family get to come to the States and have these opportunities versus others? Um, and there's also been more of a mix of more Senegalese and um, people coming over to Cape Verde and there's been mixes over the years and that kind of thing. But um, it's, it's just, it's complex, I think. It's not an easy answer. Okay. Thank you. Can I tie it? Sure. Um, if I could just tie into that, I think in addition, to, so I, I have to rephrase, actually probably it is part of my project, these questions also for dogs, but I think what you're saying also points how 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 you're identified uh, in terms of race is socially constructed, but also spatially constructed based on where you are, whether you're U.S. South or or uh, Cape Verde. So I've, uh, I've been trying to think through these things within cities for Kingston. So for instance, uh, it took me a few years. I realized it's only in downtown Kingston that people constantly call me Miss Chin because I think I'm Chinese, uh, which doesn't happen uptown. So it's sort of inconceivable for a white person to walk on the street downtown, so you must be Chinese. But uptown, it's not incongruous. And, and I think, actually, I wonder if the same things happen for dogs. So a mongrel dog, I think it's not a downtown dog, but it's a ghetto dog. So you might have a mongrel dog in someone's yard uptown, but it's less likely, and it would also be like, haha, I have a mongrel dog, I think. Mm -hmm. So so definitely the, the pure breeds are Elite dogs, though, again, coming back to your earlier question, there is also sort of a hip hop related sort of status that is cross class, I think, in terms of having a specific type of pure breed dog. Um, so it's not only wealthy people who would have a pure breed, but also, uh, for instance, in a previous project, I was looking at uh, criminal leaders, uh, and one of uh, so called dogs was telling me about his. Uh, his Doberman and how bad she was, and he fed her gunpowder to make her batter. So it was a status object also to have a pure breed downtown. But at the same time, you're totally right that the Bago dog is the epitome, I think, of of, uh, of creolization, of, of mixture. And there's also these discourses of it being very sturdy. So even if you feed it like nothing but like. Carmi. Yeah, it will, you know, it's tough. Uh, it can be out of the streets. It's, uh, so I think I, I'm wondering. Uh, I read also a long time ago, Jill Cassin has work on, on sort of colonial plants and, and the idea of plants in the Caribbean uh, and of hybridization as sort of plants as queer formations. So I'm wondering how that actually connects to the mongrel dog. So I should revisit that and see how is the mongrel dog maybe also a queer formation and how that contrasts with the, uh, the pure bee. Yeah. That's excellent. <laughs> All right. Resistance. In yeah. what I say? No, meaning, you know, the, the kind of failure to acknowledge, right, that there can be other types of fish, mm -hmm. right, is, is a resistance to a kind of Creole formation, mm -hmm. right, where you can have, you can have, right, like the Creole formation of racial typology in, in, in Denmark. But mm -hmm. there's an actual resistance. There seems to be a structural resistance, a mm -hmm. policy-based resistance, right? At least it's certainly a discursive kind of resistance where you don't fit, right? Yes. Incompatible. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, there's this thing that I say all the time as an example is that Danish means white yeah. and brown means foreigner. And if you happen to be neither, like me, then you sort of don't exist conceptually. And that's, that's very much how the inclusion 
discourse functions through the notion of Danishness. And so much is incompatible with that, Islam, brownness, and, and also the notion that you can be something and something else, and one thing doesn't take away from the other. That's, um, that's sort of unthinkable. And so also, I want to, um, to just study more the, um, how exactly the welfare uh, ideology functions, because how, what, what it looks like practically is that the notion of equality actually means sameness. And so you can have the same thing on these terms, right, if you, if you fit into the box. Um, that's pretty much how, I mean, this is a very big assimilation project, which is just not called that, right? Um, it's called integration, and it's also called um, help, actually. Um, so, so far, I mean, in the dominating discourse, it's unthinkable. And then I think there's also a question of um, generations of visible wave of immigrants, because obviously there's been immigration always, but the most visible ones um, are fairly new. Um, and so we are starting to develop alternative ways of, of being Danish together. I mean, it functions fine, right? We know how to do it. Um, but then we're also out of the national Im imaginary and we're I mean, very concretely, when you see people who want to be actors or so on, I mean, all the, the jobs that I've gotten in a, uh, in a capacity of like semi-actor dancer, it was always to play a foreigner, right? So I've been asked to speak with an accent and so on, and I said, what accent exactly would you like? Um, and I don't have it, right? Um, I think that, that says something about like how, how can you be in that uh, space which is that country as a brown person? Well, that's as a foreigner. That's like that's all we get today. So. Thank you. I had um, so following up Elizabeth, I had a question. So it seems that this is like it screams so much of cultural assimilation, and it reminds me of like um, like the narrative of the U.S. with Native Indigenous people, but it's it's like with people who are not necessarily Indigenous, um, just with like boarding schools and forced like sending your children at like one years old. But I wonder if there's also like an encouraged miscegenation happening, like with I diluting in order to create a homogenous, like eventually we'll get a Danish population that is homogenous and probably white. Like do you know if that's kind of the ultimate goal? Or like this creation of the other is like a constant process that will happen in like the plan over generations. And then I also had a really quick question for Devin. Um, you mentioned that when you were walking around like the islands in Cape Verde, that um, the public space of the actual beach was really hard to find. And I was wondering if that's because of development or if it's like an enclosure of public space of privatization. Um, and I just like, could you just clarify like that? I'm just interested. Um, I haven't really looked into discourses around miscegenation. Um, however, I recently found out that I'm actually Danish on paper, and I was surprised because, well, because of my experiences, um, but there is a type of le legislation that follows the mother and then determines what nationality your child gets, right? So that's obviously that's something else than, than um, than mixing, but there is a connection because there's very much a pattern of uh, white moms and black and brown dads, and so that way you can actually produce, on paper you can produce citizens, whereas two immigrant parents cannot, right? Um, I think, I, I can't really say much other than my gut feeling about it, but there's definitely a lot of privileges that I have having a white Danish mom in terms of access and in terms of bef af after the where are you from, where are you really from, and no, I mean where are you like from before that. After those questions, when people are like, oh, okay, okay, so you actually do sort of belong, right? There are some things that are um, 
that you actually can get access to that other people who have different answers to those questions can't. So even if it is completely unconscious, but it is sort of a positive feature to have um, mixed heritage. Because it's just proximity, right? Then you're just easier and um, in, in another generation you actually can be not Danish. I see. My, my friend's kids are like white. And they look like me. Well, I, I, it's, it's not right to predict every Dutch thing on your, your story, uh, but, but I was interested to, on the one hand, in the Netherlands also, it doesn't matter if you have one Dutch parent because you, you will be foreign into perpetuity, one, one grandparent and now it's one great, uh, is enough. Uh, so it wouldn't work in that way, but I'm, my feeling for the Netherlands is that uh, there's actually, a, a, maybe similar to also the Caribbean in some ways, a fetishization of the mixed brown child. So it, it is seen as cuter than a blonde child. So uh, a brown child with uh, curly hair, it won't be spoken in race because there's no race to speak, but I was so cute, so so much cuter than all the other kids, right? Like in daycare, uh, you know, oh, you know, amongst all these blonde kids, so cute. So I, I don't think it's um, a whiteification, uh, the cuteness may stop at a certain age, but I, I don't think it's uh, necessarily, uh, yeah, disappear culturally totally, but I, I don't, I don't think uh, for the Netherlands uh, it, it would necessarily be a project of, of whitening in the same way that you might find in other spaces. But but I don't know if you if that's completely distinct from. I mean, what it makes me think about is also the some of the difficulties I've had with U.S. American race categories and and theorizations of blackness. Because the thing is that the way if you're mixed race. Uh, black, white, and look like me, but are like four years old, then you're cute, as you say. If you look like someone who will be categorized as Arab, that's very different, right? So it's not, you can't always put blackness on the bottom, right? Um, because, yeah, th there are ways to be racialized in very exotifying terms. Um, and then there are ways to be racialized as well, non-existent, as the inert, as the Roma, and then as Arab, which is uh, the criminal. Um, yeah, I think you grow out of cuteness. I, I know you grow out of cuteness. You can't, they can't save you for, yeah, enjoy. Another question for me. That I just wanted to respond to that because that's such a good conversation. But um, that extends to the states too, is like as well, everywhere where you have like this mixed kid being the cutest kid, but it's not the fact that oh, white kids aren't as cute, it's just that's the amount of blackness we'll accept as far as cuteness because of the rejection of blackness, um, which can be internal and but is a reflection off of whiteness. Um, because it's interesting that I was thinking about how you were um, the context in which you're talking about acceptance and being at a certain, um, because of your composition that you're able to see things from a different perspective and that privilege but using it in, in that kind of exploring way. I think it's the same with education levels and there's different intersections of that because like, for example, I come from low income, single mother, background, food insecurity, hygiene insecurity, all those things. So really I look at myself as a post-occupancy evaluation, you know, because now that I have this degree, and I only have a bachelor, so I don't even know how I got on this panel. But <laughs> I was like, finesse. <laughs> but it's the, the license of having my like architecture license and then the wealth of my life experience, like, I know how valuable that is. I know that's more valuable to me than any type of academic experience that nobody would, that you would never be able to have. You know, so like because of that experience that and that other people, and there's experiences that I could buy into, but probably not um, just based on the wealth gap and um, history of generational poverty. Um, unless you know, I get a scholarship or something. Hey, Berkeley. Um, but um, but anyway, sorry, I'm just I'm ridiculous. Um, 
But because I got licensed, really, that's where I see my level of privilege coming in because people value like the same thing, like, oh, you're actually Danish. Okay, after this series of questions, it's like people don't value my opinion. Certain people don't value my opinion until they hear I'm a licensed architect um, because I'm, I kind of can walk that line and I know, you know, certain, I have a certain lexicon and that kind of thing, but I'm also from the hood, essentially, so. Um, oh, and just to answer your question really quick, the, the little portion of beach was just what was left because of construction of this giant casino that's happening. So that's all that the Cape Verdean people were able to experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, three quick questions. Um, uh, regarding Cape Verde, your architect, uh, could you, is there, do you have a vision yet of what you would like to build there? community or support community development there? Like something, do you have something in mind? Right. Um, Denmark, there's a lot of people talking a lot about Denmark in the UK, there's a lot of conversations and research, I'm just aware of it very recently. Uh, Zizek Johnson, who I know very well, who's raised in Denmark, um, and Aman Hassani was talking a lot about um, uh, how, how, gen how male, a Muslim man, how, how they are objectified in the Danish society as part of this. Um, but also I was thinking of um, Hazel Carpey's book, Imperial Intimacies, because I was thinking a lot about the things she was saying, although obviously she was talking about the concept in the 50s, Britain, but very much echoed some of the themes that you were discussing. Um, but also most recently about citizenship being taken away so that you can be black British, there is a concept of that, but, but you can lose that Britishness if you transgress in some way, or are perceived to transgress. Um, and also, I'm a diaspora of the Jamaica. I'm a bit troubled by this conversation on dogs. I'm just wondering, because I'm not into the post-human, because for me, we're still trying to find our lives. So I'm just wondering how this relates back to the lives of the Jamaicans who are fighting for their lives at the moment. So um, I see myself as a post-occupancy evaluator, like I just said. So like for example, I grew up in Fayetteville, so in Fayetteville I know exactly what it looks like, what I want to do, but I guess the underlying aspect of that would translate to Cape Verde is anything that would help the people transcend um, economic issues. And of course, I mean, I've read that it's, I think it's like 238 years for an Ameri a black American to catch up to their white counterparts. And I think uh, the, the, the black family is actually, like a, a nuclear black family is in the same position as a white single mother, like that's as far as economically. So there's things that are not going to, you know, but whatever type of thing that I can lay down for the framework of people, whether it's something that provides resources, something that generates incomes in, mul in multiple different ways, and then that the people could have ownership of, and then also continue that learning and teaching for the next generations and then also provide economic um, support. What that looks like in Fayetteville for me, um, there's a lot of uh, abandoned, so Food Lion is our grocery store and it's being bought out by all these like, you know, really nice grocery stores now that Fayetteville is coming up. There's a military base there. Um, the last place I thought gentrification could happen, but lo and behold. So you have these abandoned buildings and in these black areas creating food deserts right up the street from where I live, Strickland Bridge. So I started, I went home after my trip and I just started looking at stuff and I'm like, what could we do here? And I, I'm thinking of, okay, where do black dollars go? You know, where if you can't buy anything, what are you still gonna do for your self care? And what are you gonna do to maintain? And that's things that have to do with you know, our hair or, if we're, or our skin or whatever. And then if we have, and there's a social component to that too, and if we have, it's, you know, still, you, you, it's not a, you just flip over and you go to college and get a degree and you're, you're successful. That's not how that works, but there are certifications. So what ways can we um, empower those certifications? So I thought of having this space where there's precedent spaces that exist, but a space where you could um, rent for a cheaper amount, uh, a leasable space within this abandoned building that would be reconstructed, something like a co-working, living kind of space but have your own entrepreneurial entity and can over the year as your business grows because if you think about the square footage of a grocery store something that's really large it could be modular and you could um, build up 
and out into it and then not have to, you know, you have this certification as a hair braider or a, a psychologist or, I mean, like a, a social worker or whatever it is, but anything that would, the thing that would tie it together would just be for the, the um, communal self-care that's communal because I think that goes back to us ancestrally that that's how we get that care for ourselves because even personally when I went back to Cape Verde I felt like I was able to have a childhood that I didn't have and it was because I was not in a position where I was like a part of that household but they they treated me in a way where I could just relax I was the most relaxed and least stressed I'd ever been in my life and my friend was like black girls don't get this opportunity so any ways that I can share that feeling and the the parallel progression through your generational um, ability to provide is is what I want to do and I don't know what that looks like exactly yet but I'm trying to think of it in a really um, holistic way that it's sustainable and not just here's this community center um, I don't know much about the debate in the UK no, or no, Denmark no no there's the people from Denmark who are currently based in the UK oh, so they're okay. raising the subject you know because we don't know that much because right. Denmark is very good at giving this sort of global message of it being you know, yeah very progressive yeah. And, and so on um, that I, I want to look more into um, both the way uh, Muslim men are portrayed, even if it's in our face all the time, and then also the, the point you raised about losing your citizenship. I think there are cases of that, which is both because of this like um, mixed heritage thing, if you if your mom is the foreigner and so on, so you don't automatically become Danish and so on. I think there, I have heard of, of some cases where teenagers ascend home to a country they have never been in, they didn't speak the language and so on. Um, but it's not a big systematic thing that has affected like a generation, for example, and so on. But that's again, that's also about this thing about um, the kind of immigrant that is being demonized in a particular way, those generations are so new. So I would be interested in, in looking at has that happened to, for example, the Turkish or Moroccan immigrants who came way before, so their kids are my age. Um, what the status is there um, for people who came as guest workers and so on. Um, and Hazel Harvey. As, I don't know if you're based here, but she was just here, and, um, and 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 has a whole chapter called "Where You're From," right? And so that was actually extremely moving for me personally to see this question being taken up in a serious way, and also that like we can have emotions in the academy, because that's what drives it. And um, and I think there's it's such a rich question. It does so much, right? It, like it has so much agency. So I was very happy about that. Um, I don't have so many answers. Those are also questions that I have for myself, and this was just a tiny, tiny bit of what is this, what it is that I'm thinking about and that I want to put into my dissertation eventually. But thank you for thinking with me. <laughs> thank you. All right, so we're out of time for oh. this panel, but is there one more answer? So I just want to, were there comments or questions? The last two. Were there? Someone else? Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm just trying to get uh, sense. So go, no, I want you to answer. I'm not sure that. Okay. Uh, thank you for your question. I mean, it is for me very central actually to this project to also be part of a critique of, of a type of post humanism or more than human geographies that skips over all the historically for differentiations of this category of the human. Uh, and we also see in the Anthropocene who, who is this human? There's no. Uh, one or humanity has not been accepted for everyone as, as everyone here is showing. But for me, it, it is to ask precisely like taking people's lives and their risks and precarities um, that people are living in, in, in the everyday to think how those uneven distributions are mediated through animal lives. And I don't think every animal necessarily has a big part in it. Uh, 
But I think just as we could look at how infrastructure solidifies um, so, and sometimes in unexpected ways, but often in, in very planned ways, cements inequality into the urban landscape, I think it's also important to look not only what humans do to humans, but how they do it via um, unanticipated or, or unseen ways that, that involve buildings uh, and animals. So, so my part is precisely to think about endangerment as well as protection and to ask who do dogs protect and who do they endanger and how do they do that? And can we also take that on board as part of our project of, of thinking how does this world stay unequal and how might we also try to transform it? So I, I hope that answers the question. It's an answer. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we have a 15 minute break or so before the last session of the day where we'll be thinking. What's that? Why are you doing Huh? Yeah, I know. Um, so, yeah, 15 minute break, and we'll see you shortly.